All right, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Fred Schaefer from the Adult Ed Board, who is sponsoring this. A um, couple of brief comments, and then we're going to hear from Dr. Lennon. Uh, on February 24th of this year, the world changed. We all know that. And since then, we have been watching in both horror and hope as the events in Ukraine from the defeat of the Russian forces trying to take Kyiv to the horror of Mariupol and now the current Ukrainian counteroffensive. Uh, but throughout, we have been praying for David to defeat Goliath. Somebody back there said that earlier. Anyways, uh, today's topic is about what's next, and we're really happy to have Dr. Alina Lennon here. Uh, she comes to us with great credentials, uh, great endorsements, and to begin with, she was born and raised in eastern Ukraine. Okay, you think Mariupol, you think Donbass, that's eastern Ukraine. That's the war zone. She still has family there. She came to the U.S. as a Fulbright Scholar to the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, earned her Ph.D., went back to Ukraine, and eventually she and her family relocated here. Um, she is professor, or, excuse me, practitioner in residence in national security at the University of New Haven. And what I would like to say is welcome to you. We're very happy to have you here. And over to you, Dr. Lennon. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you so much for having me in your beautiful church. Is the sound coming up? OK. Um, all right, well, again, thank you so much for uh, taking you know, some time this Sunday afternoon uh, to uh, talk about Ukraine. Hopefully, it will be a conversation um, at the risk of inflicting the pain of PowerPoint presentation on you uh, on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I am going to present um, just a few slides here uh, just to get us started. Um, I'm getting feedback. Uh, how is it coming out on your end? It's fine. It's fine? OK. Um, maybe I'll just, I'll just have to get over it. Um, but um, you know, as, as you can see here, my goal today is to talk about uh, you know, some of the fundamentals, really, why Russia reinvaded Ukraine. I'm from eastern Ukraine, from the Donbas area. You know, for me personally, the war started in 2014. So we've been at it for eight years now. Uh, of course, now the world is paying more attention, and it's a, a larger scale war and a much more brutal war, but you know, my family um, uh, and at my hometown ended up being one of the early, one of the first occupied towns, and it has been occupied for eight years. Um, so it's not a new development necessarily, but, but of course now the entire country um, is uh, completely um, uh, overwhelmed by this war. If in the past, when I used to travel to Ukraine, it seemed as though you know, the war was concentrated in the east, but the rest of the country you know, was pretty much business as usual. In some ways, as um, you know, some, one of my uh, uh, friends said, uh, the war in Ukraine used to have a geographic address. Um, you know, there was a very clear delineation as, as to when the war zone begins. But now, when you travel to Ukraine, it's very clear that um, it, it's a national war effort. It concerns absolutely everybody. Uh, because it's an existential crisis. It, it's, a, it's a war for Ukraine's survival. It's not about eastern or western Ukraine, southern or northern Ukraine. It's about the survival of the Ukrainian state. Um, and first of all, I want to applaud all of you uh, for um, being informed and for caring and giving. I watched um, Reverend Rowe's um, Rose lecture on Ukraine, sermon on Ukraine, uh, and a, a compelling message that he gave about despair and hope. Um, and uh, you know, hope always uh, overcomes despair. And, and I want to echo his words for congrat and congratulate you on being an informed church, a caring church, a giving church, um, and uh, you know, a, a church that, that cares. Because I really do think that um, this is not a war in Ukraine. It's a war against all things good, um, you know, by all things bad. Um, so what I um, wanted to, to start with, to get the conversation going, because I do want to hear your thoughts and, and your questions, uh, is to talk about you know, why Russia reinvaded now, um, you know, why this was um, you know, a compelling decision on, of, on Putin's part, Russia's miscalculations, you know, where Russia miscalculated, not just um, tactically, but also strategically and politically, 
how Ukraine has turned the tide against Russia. Um, you might have heard, hopefully, have been following the news of the past week and know that um, there has been a, a tremendous um, uh, counteroffensive in, in Kharkiv that allowed Ukraine to liberate most of the areas uh, in the Kharkiv region in the northeast that it took Russia five months to occupy. So this has been uh, an incredible counteroffensive and, and up, you know, a, an example of operational deception, really, uh, that baited Russia in the south and allowed Ukraine to roll through northeastern parts and, and liberate most of those areas. Um, I, I can foresee books and books written about just that one operation alone. Uh, but this war has already gone down in history in more than one way. Um, and then finally, I, you know, I think we, I want to spend most of our time talking about, uh, to quote General Petraeus, tell me how this ends. Um, as he famously said before, the United States invaded Iraq, um, whether, you know, there is an end in sight. Um, so I, I'd like to present some of my ideas. These are hypothetical scenarios, but I think they're important intellectual exercises as we um, continue unpacking this war and, and look for ways to uh, manage the crisis. Um, uh, so just to give you a brief update as far as where things are as of now, um, this map here comes from Institute for the Study of War. Uh, I do recommend it, as a, by the way, as, as a, an incredible source uh, to keep up with the war effort and the most recent developments. You know, they, are, they do incredible work um, mapping, uh, you know, battleground dynamics and also um, areas of control by both parties. So Ukraine now has recaptured most of Kharkiv region um, and has turned the tide of war. Um, the, you know, Russia has revised its war aims uh, since um, uh, the retreat from Kiev and now since the retreat from uh, Kharkiv area. Um, Russia seems to be consolidating their gains in eastern Donbass and just recently Russia's President uh, Vladimir Putin uh, announced that the plan has always been to control just eastern, eastern parts of Donbass and, and that's where they're concentrating their efforts. So they're, they seem to be revising their war, war aims uh, rhetorically but also on the battlefield. Um, as a, um, in a show of frustration and retaliation, um, uh, having suffered tremendous defeats, uh, Russia seems to have resorted to a campaign of terror by striking, uh, by firing missiles into residential areas, but also targeting Ukraine's civil and military infrastructure. Um, uh, the general trajectory of correlation of forces is in Ukraine's favor right now, um, as um, about a quarter of Russia's military power has already been depleted. Um, and, um, you know, even if uh, Russia announced general mobilization tomorrow, they would not be able to reverse the, uh, the, the gains by the Ukrainian army as it would take uh, time and effort and, and, uh, on the part of the Russian military to even, um, uh, you know, present to, to, to produce a force that could uh, match Ukraine's level of training and capabilities. Um, so, right now, it is, um, Ukraine's goal is to build on this momentum. It's an incredible momentum and, and seize this operational initiative uh, to continue um, liberating areas occupied by Russia. But also to deny Russia um, this, um, um, uh, you know, momentum uh, that would allow them to dig in and, and um, continue advancing on the Ukrainian territory. So the Russians have reorganized tactically since then, um, but it's not... Um, it's not the kind of learning and adjustment that they can turn around quickly. Um, so Ukraine now has, um, you know, a few, a few weeks, if not months, uh, where it could have decisive advantage on the battlefield. Of course, as you all know, the, um, you know, the, the success of the, of the Ukrainian army um, is not, uh, it has not been possible, would not be possible without the support of, of Western allies, Western partners. All right. So as far as, um, just very briefly, you know, the cost of the war so far, and again, we're only six months into this. Um, you know, keep in mind that, um, you know, that Russia first invaded in 2014 and the line was frozen for eight years. So in, even, in, in, you know, with the perspective of, of that timeline, six months is still just the beginning. Even though the war has already been divided into multiple phases, I think historians will ultimately judge as to which phase we're in. Uh, but we're still in the initial phases of the war, even though Ukraine has turned uh, the tide, uh, you know, to, to everybody's surprise. You know, but uh, currently, um, you know, the war has been it just absolutely devastating um, with Russia continuing indiscriminate strikes on, on Ukraine's uh, civil, civilian areas, but also uh, critical infrastructure and military objects as well. Uh, Ukraine's economy has tanked um, by, by half, and uh, as you may know too, um, there's a deepening global food crisis in, in the world as both Russia and Ukraine are actually 
uh, provide almost half of the world's green export. Um, so this has uh, had an effect on uh, many countries in the Middle East and Africa as well. Um, energy crisis in Europe obviously is, is another externality uh, of, of this war that is not limited to Ukraine but has made this a global event that concerns everybody. All right, so um, as far as um, Putin's, you know, why Putin invaded, reinvaded uh, Ukraine and um, what went wrong? Um, first of all, you know, the, the reason uh, Putin's, Putin has already failed strategically um, is because he's uh, fundamentally uh, failed to match um, means to ends. So Putin set out maximalist political aims uh, with uh, his military not being able to execute those um, in the way that Putin had envisioned. Um, but the campaign of denazification and demilitarization, as uh, you know, Putin himself labeled uh, that special operation, is fundamentally born out of historical revisionism and uh, colonialism. As Timothy Snyder says, you know, this is fundamentally a colonial war in which uh, Russia does not see Ukraine as a sovereign state or even uh, an entity that is able to govern itself. So this is a, not just a um, post-colonial, it's a neo-colonial world order in which Russia aims to subjugate Ukraine as part of its own sphere of inf uh, influence. Um, and Putin believes that Ukrainians have been pawns in, in the Western hands, and the, the West has exploited Ukraine to get closer to Russia, move its military infrastructure, move its political infrastructure to Russia's border, but Ukraine doesn't have any agency. It, it, just been, it has been manipulated by the West, and the people of Ukraine just don't know how to govern themselves. Therefore, um, it is upon Putin to uh, reclaim the control of the Ukrainian nation. So it's fundamentally colonial in nature, and I suggest, I do recommend uh, Tim Snyder's work on, on, on that topic, but also two phenomenal historians, Serhii Plohi and Yaroslav Hrtsak, uh, who, uh, you know, spent a, a lot of, a lot, dedicated a lot of their research to this idea of historical revisionism in which Russia aims to restore the greater Russia that includes Ukraine. Uh, one of the other miscalculations that Putin had made was he fundamentally uh, overestimated his own military force. Um, and uh, his, uh, his intelligence is, is curated. So Putin doesn't necessarily receive accurate information about uh, the, the status of his own military force. Uh, corruption is rampant in, in Russia, and as we found out um, after the invasion, reinvasion, uh, a lot of um, you know, numbers and, and statistics that we had been presented about you know, the, how great Russia's military was were actually made up. Um, so they didn't necessarily match the reality, as a lot of their equipment was uh, mismanaged, broken, uh, so they didn't necessarily deliver uh, uh, the, the, the type of combat power that Putin had envisioned. Um, um, on top of that, uh, Russia had overestimated its previous successes in uh, much smaller uh, scale uh, operations and campaigns. Um, and those um, you know, small scale campaigns allowed Russia to kind of uh, or re-energized Russia in, in believing that they can pull something off uh, in Ukraine, similar to what they did in Georgia, um, limited campaign in, in Ukraine in 2014, Syria, and Kosovo, and so on and so forth. Um, so they were, again, the, these were uh, fundamentally strategic mistakes um, that allow me and some of um, you know, more prominent um, scholars and experts to conclude that Russia has, strategically, Russia has already failed because Putin has um, failed to match his objectives with capabilities um, of his own military. Um, Putin also miscalculated Ukraine's military. They thought that they could just roll in Kiev uh, and expect no, um, no defense, no um, uh, obstruction. And, and that, of course, uh, was a major miscalculation that, again, goes back to this idea uh, to Putin's hubris um, and um, imperialism that kind of you know, created this illusion in his head that Ukraine has no defense to speak of and, they, and that Russia could just um, roll in um, and um, occupy Kiev and overthrow Zelensky's regime. Um, uh, Putin had also underestimated that Ukraine in 2014 uh, was not Ukraine in 1991 and Ukraine in 2022 is not Ukraine of 2014. Um, Ukrainian identity now fundamentally is centered on uh, the idea of uh, citizenship, not ethnicity or language. Uh, the revival of Ukrainian national identity has been phenomenal, um, not just since 1991, but since, ni since 2014, and even more so now. I was just um, uh, in Ukraine uh, recently, in June and July, uh, 
Um, and again, it was amazing for me to see what, you know, I was in Western Ukraine, and then I traveled to Kiev, um, that something that was so obvious to me is this new sense of unity, that even in 2014, in response to the initial invasion, there was still a sizable contingent of people in Eastern Ukraine who uh, believed that, you know, that Ukraine um, would be better off negotiating with Russia and restoring economic relations. Um, but now there's absolutely no appetite for making concessions to Russia or to, um, you know, uh, making any territorial or political concessions to Russia as uh, most Ukrainians believe that um, Russia's objectives are now on full display because it aims to fundamentally destroy the Ukrainian state um, and deny Ukraine its sovereignty and statehood. Um, everybody underestimated Volodymyr Zelensky. I think I, I, I would, uh, wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that even Ukrainians were probably caught by surprise just by how, um, um, how he found his moment in history really and really galvanized Ukrainians around this um, war effort. Um, but I think, uh, as much as I think he really deserves a, a lot of credit for the level of patriotism and resilience that he had galvanized, but I do think it, there's a feedback loop that Zelensky is galvanized by Ukrainians as much as uh, Ukrainians are galvanized by him. So um, Ukraine has become a horizontal society in which even removing Zelensky, and that's what Putin didn't realize, that even if Zelensky were to be removed, the Ukrainian society would never live under Russian control. There would be a massive insurgency and, and resistance movement um, that would not allow Russian proxies to even occupy you know, local um, and, and regional government offices, let alone the national office. Um, so that was a fundamental underestimation of Ukraine's um, democracy and that it's a horizontal society. It's a parliamentary democracy in which the president is galvanized by the people and they galvanize him in, uh, in return. It's not a vertical uh, structure as, as it is in Russia. Um, and then finally, um, Putin had completely underestimated the West's solidarity and resolve, assuming that Russia's energy would be key uh, to uh, Europe making concessions to Russia. But what we found out is that the Europeans themselves were probably surprised by the level of solidarity they presented. Um, but Russia was not the only one that miscalculated. Um, I think, now in retrospect, I think it would be fair to say that we here in the West um, have also underestimated Putin because we did not provide Ukraine with uh, offensive capabilities that it needed urgently on the battlefield. You know, we were, we're still playing catch up with, um, Ukraine needs much more, much better, uh, much more sophisticated capabilities to repel Russia's attacks. But I think the West could have done more sooner because we knew at the end of, um, uh, in December of 2021 when Russia was amassing troops around Kiev that this was looking to be an offensive on Kiev, not in Eastern Ukraine. Um, and yet the West, I think, also optimistically assumed that Putin was just not that crazy. Um, and I don't think he is. He's just more, uh, he's a much, um, he accepts more risk than I think we gave him credit for. So we underestimated Putin's chauvinism and uh, revanchist ambitions. Um, if you look at the denazification and demilitarization campaign that Putin um, announced in Ukraine, then it becomes obvious after we know what happened in Bucha and now uh, as new areas are liberated in the Kharkiv region, um, mass graves, uh, signs, evidence of torture um, are you know, coming to the surface in the Zoom, which is a critical, critical infrastructure hub in uh, the Kharkiv region that just got recently, a few days ago, uh, was liberated by the Ukrainian forces and, and now the uh, Ukraine's general staff has uncovered um, so many w more war crimes um, that had happened under Russia's occupation. That is to say that Russia's idea of, of denazification basically equates um, Nazi denazification to de-Ukrainization. So, in, in the Russian, from the Russian point of view, to denazify Ukraine is to de-Ukrainianize Ukraine. Um, and everybody who is um, anti-Russian is perceived to be an enemy. So even witness accounts um, in occupied territories, whether it's in around uh, Kyiv or in the Kharkiv region, um, 
you know, they would, had presented a story where Russian military, Russian soldiers would go do door to door and if they, and ask people if they, if they were pro-Ukraine or pro-Russia and, and of course, you know, everybody, you know, civilians were scared and they were looking, mostly looked uh, for men um, and, you know, uh, forced mobilization was in effect and, and forced men to, to join their ranks and fight on Russia's side. Um, but when people um, presented themselves as neutral for fear of, 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 um, of retribution, they would go into their houses and, and if they found any books in the Ukrainian language, that would be considered as, a, as evidence that they're pro-Ukraine. Now imagine in Ukraine, having you know history of Ukraine in the Ukrainian language in your library uh, becomes your verdict. Now that's uh, that's the level of uh, you know, genocidal tendencies that you know we see on display in Russia, and, that, and that's exactly why there's absolutely no um, no appetite for any concessions, knowing that this is how Russia is going to rule in Ukraine, that this will be ethnic cleansing and genocide, um, even on on larger scale. We also overemphasized here in the West, from my point of view, we overemphasized NATO enlargement and physical security concerns. For Russia, physical security was secondary to identity, to ontological security. Ontological security that looks at Ukraine as an extricable part of Russian identity. So for Russia, losing Ukraine is an identity crisis. NATO expansion, didn't, it, was a, it was a rhetoric, it was a convenient narrative that created this uh, you know, uh, Russia versus West dynamic. Uh, but fundamentally for Russia, Ukraine is more than just a matter of physical security. Um, it's, it's a matter of um, identi identity security. Um, we also, here in the West, underestimated the Ukrainians' will to fight. Um, and we're, everybody was surprised by the level of patriotism and resilience, courage uh, and will to fight that Ukrainians demonstrated. And I think had we measured that and estimated that more accurately, the West would have been much more proactive in supplying Ukraine with the capabilities they, they supply them with anyway, but you know, um, now it's, it's mostly a race against time. Um, the, the West has also misunderstood Russia's nuclear saber rattling. Um, and, and you know, Russia's military doctrine uh, presupposes the use of nuclear weapons as, uh, as a signal or a threat of the use of nuclear weapons to protect its conventional forces on the ground, to intimidate the opponent, to paralyze the opponent, and to allow the advancement of conventional forces. Um, so the, the Russia talks about nuclear weapons much more casually uh, than what's normal in the West. So when Putin, if you may remember, uh, the war started on, or the invasion started on, on the 24th of February. On February 27th, Putin put his strategic nuclear forces on high alert. And that, I think, also you know, created that effect, exactly the effect that he had hoped for, that the West felt intimidated and deterred. And I think also uh, didn't supply Ukraine with some of the more sophisticated offensive capabilities at the risk of escalation. Uh, and I think we overestimated that nuclear rhetoric, assuming that Putin was actually going to act on his threats. But again, Russian military doctrine uh, presupposes the use of uh, nuclear threat as a way of uh, facilitating conventional troops' movement on the ground. Okay, so how Ukraine has turned the tide against Russia? I mean, first and foremost, uh, of course, uh, the morale and the resolve of the Ukrainian troops is absolutely uh, incredible. Um, Ukraine has been able to successfully repel the Russian attack and inflict enormous losses on uh, Russian forces, not least due to its um, much more effective war fighting strategy and tactics, um, Western training and uh, capabilities, including long range capabilities, munitions, equipment. Um, Western intelligence, as you may know, has been critical um, in the successful execution of, of, um, of many of Ukraine's uh, successful operations against Russia. Um, but Ukraine also has a, a highly, um, a large volunteer corps and, and about a million reservists. And that's due to the fact that instead of fleeing the country, uh, a lot of people chose to stay and fight. And that's another thing that the West and Russia underestimated is that as much as about you know, 4 million, um, more than 4 million, well, there's 12 million, million displaced people, um, but approximately, I think it's the, the number is more like 5 million refugees um, had fled Ukraine, uh, but many more have come back and joined the war effort. And a lot of my friends, you know, former teachers, journalists, doctors, 
um, have joined the fight. Um, they joined territorial defense forces that are, um, you know, sort of designed as volunteer battalions that are designed that were created to be its own branch, but nonetheless, their primary mission was to patrol the streets of their own towns um, in anticipation of a potential sort of urban warfare uh, as, as what we saw in Kyiv in the beginning. Um, but since then, because of Ukraine has also suffered tremendous losses that it does not report because you know, the morale is very important to Ukraine. Ukraine, um, the national policy in Ukraine right now is to not disclose the official statistics um, or you know, provide very general guidelines um, and estimates as to not to um, diminish some of that uh, morale and, and optimism that, that I think has been uh, instrumental in, in, in Ukraine's war effort. Um, but what's, what I wanted to say about the TDF, the Territorial Defense Force, is that um, a lot of young people have joined these um, uh, territorial defense forces in their towns, and since then they had been deployed to the front lines uh, to, uh, to, as a stopgap measure. You know, they're not as well trained, um, but they have uh, been able to learn quickly, um, and as, you know, a lot of them have been trained by Western partners as well in the use of some of these capabilities. Um, so um, motivation and morale have been absolutely instrumental in, in Ukraine's effort. Um, you know, and, and I know that you've, uh, in, in your previous sermons, um, the, uh, the tales of Ukrainian Davids fighting against uh, Russian Goliath, I think, has, has really caught on. And I think that's, that's also something that allowed Ukraine to establish dominance in the information uh, sphere and highlighting the bravery and heroism of Ukrainian people um, that I think really allowed to mobilize support around the world and win the hearts and minds of people around the world. Uh, and that has been no less important. And that's also Zelensky's brand, and that's what he's really good at, is, is uh, um, creating a good narrative and really um, kind of mobilizing support around um, uh, a, um, an act of heroism that, that Ukraine had displayed. Um, just very briefly, public opinion in Ukraine during war, when, as we begin to talk about, you know, how, tell me how this ends, you know, what's, what's next? Then ultimately, um, as Zelensky himself acknowledged, uh, all wars end at a negotiating table, okay? So at some point, whether it's gonna be Zelensky's uh, administration uh, or Putin's, which I personally don't believe that any negotiations will take place between Zelensky and Putin in, in the foreseeable future, it will change, it will take a change of administration in both countries. Uh, most likely. But the reason why uh, the, the negotiations are unlikely is also because of public opinion in Ukraine. And again, Ukraine is not a top-down democracy. It's a bottom-up democracy where even if Zelensky begins to make concessions, um, there will be a massive backlash, especially now when everybody is armed um, and has uh, military experience. Um, so it, it's, it's going to be much harder to, uh, to pacify a, a civil resistance movement. Uh, but 90% of, of respondents in March um, believed that uh, Ukraine can win this. And you can imagine with that level of optimism and spirit, and this, com this is coming from people who are in a war zone. You know, it's not coming from people like myself, Ukrainian Americans, um, who, you know, for the most part removed from it, although obviously, you know, my family is still in, in the war zone. Um, but. So this is, again, the, the level of, of uh, resist, resilience that Ukrainians have demonstrated. Um, the majority of Ukrainians believe that they will be able to repel Russia's attacks, um, and they also support uh, Ukraine's accession to the EU and NATO. All right, um, conversely, I think public opinion in Russia is what um, you know, interests people the most, as um, there is an anticipation that there will be a, uh, you know, uh, some sort of a uh, coup, coup d'etat, or at least a resistance movement that can potentially undermine Putin's regime and, and uh, fracture it enough to where it will fall apart or Putin will be overthrown. Um, we have not seen that, though, um, quite as, 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 as we predicted, as the majority of people in Russia, according to most recent public opinion polls, which of course should be taken with a grain of salt, but Levada Center is as independent as it gets when it comes to measuring Russia's public opinion. Um, you know, puts numbers in not as overwhelming, but still, you know, the, the majority of Russians uh, support this special operation and, and they uh, support the Russian military's actions in Ukraine. And what 
Um, on top of that, you know, there seems to be a Ukraine fatigue in Russia as less people are paying attention. I think that part of it is just a coping mechanism, right? Just, just normalizing um, this, uh, this war as something that the government does and it, for them it's, it's better to not to interfere. Um, of course, you know, this level of um, support of, of this special operation is um, also a function of um, censorship that Putin has taken to new extremes. Uh, the uh, um, public discontent is rising in Russia, but uh, Putin has coup-proofed his regime. He has been coup-proofing his regime for 20 years. The, the Russian, Putin's regime by design, um, you know, it's, it's, its institutional structure is such that it cannot be overthrown in, in a popular uprising. So unless it will take nothing short of an entire security apparatus to turn on Putin, it's only if Russian security service and or the military uh, that has the critical mass to turn on Putin that any possibility of a, of a coup uh, it, you know, might happen in Russia. Uh, but as far as popular discontent and how it can be channeled and translated into that critical mass to overthrow Putin, um, again, the entire system is designed to be uh, coup-proof. Um, so we, you know, it, it's, it's, it would be awfully optimistic on our part to believe that the Russians will uh, rise up against Putin. It, it, it will be, you know, the, any, any discontent and dissent will be clamped down um, immediately. Um, so that brings us to the conversation about you know, what's next? So here are some of the scenarios I wanted to entertain um, and present for your consideration, um, and comments and questions. Um, the most likely scenario, in my opinion, is uh, that it will be a protracted war. It will be a war of attrition uh, because right now there is absolutely no stalemate. Both sides believe that they, have, they can still gain the upper hand while Ukraine has the upper hand right now um, that is hoping to sustain. Um, but I think what people may not realize is that the Russians, well, I, I don't know about you know, average Russians, but definitely not the political elites, they don't believe that they're losing. From their point of view, this is gonna take a while, uh, that they're, they're in no rush. Putin himself said, we're in no rush. You know, this is, things are going well. Um, that they're making slow, incremental gains uh, in, in the Donbass. Um, and that they will ev eventually grind Ukrainians down uh, and just press on. Um, what Putin is hoping for is that eventually the West will get tired of helping Ukraine, whether it's for material constraints, political constraints, resource constraints, that as governments turn in, in Western democracies, that that support may, may or may not be continual. Whereas in Russia, you know, we can pretty much predict his foreign policy for the next 50 years. So I think that that's what Putin is banking on, on the fact that uh, while Ukraine is enjoying this level of support now, that over time, the West will be preoccupied with their domestic concerns, you know, energy prices, uh, defense spending, um, defense production, and, and having to replenish our own capabilities now in the U.S. that we had given to Ukrainians. So he's in no rush. They are prepared for a war of attrition and they believe they can still win it. So does Ukraine. Ukraine has nowhere to go. Y Ukraine, um, it has nowhere to retreat. So it will also keep fighting for as long as it takes as it has few options other than defend its territory. Um, frozen conflict. This is, um, uh, in my opinion, a, a, a very, there is a very highly, um, high probability of a frozen conflict as, you know, eventually one of the sides is going to be depleted enough to call for a ceasefire or negotiations, and it will likely le lead to the freezing of a line of contact. Um, now, it's, gonna, it's probably going to look worse than it, it did in 2014, 2015, when the Minsk II agreement was signed uh, that uh, froze the line of contact uh, around these self-proclaimed republics. Um, if there is a frozen conflict, then Russia will end up holding more territory than in 2014 and 2015, um, and enforcing this ceasefire will require significant international engagement, not just uh, by way of continual weapon supplies, but also um, keeping sanctions on Russia and potentially even sending a peacekeeping force. Now, that's a conversation that I think we should be at least, you know, entertaining in our heads as far as 
what a, um, an international peacekeeping force might potentially look like um, if there was, in fact, a ceasefire agreement at some point down the road. Although, again, there are no signs of concessions right now. Um, while Russia's military has been depleted, its economy is unlikely to collapse completely in the near future due to China's, India's, and North Korea's support. Uh, Ch Russia has actually been replenishing some of its losses with the help of China, India, and North Korea. Now, obviously, um, you know, those are not the most, um, perhaps, you know, optimal or reliable partners, but nonetheless, uh, those are, you know, stopgap measures that uh, Russia had reverted to um, given uh, expert control sanctions that prevent Russia from rebuilding its, its, its military machine uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, it, it might be impossible for Russia to finance its war in Ukraine. The, cur the current level uh, is estimated at 500 million a day. Russia is spending 500 million a day in Ukraine on artillery shells, missiles, uh, and sustaining its troops, and so on and so forth. At the current level um, of uh, financing this war machine, it, it may not be able to sustain it, but it doesn't mean that it will stop it. Um, that brings me to uh, the next possibility, that Putin will declare a partial victory. He cornered himself. He, he's in the position where um, you know, he uh, has no good options, uh, really. And it w what's possible is that Putin will do the same thing he did when, uh, when the Russian forces were forced out of Kiev area. It just reframe the objectives and say, well, we didn't want Kiev to begin with. So it's very likely that for his own domestic purposes, Putin might change the narrative and say, well, we, we got the Donbass and parts of the south of southern Ukraine, so that's all we wanted, and we're going to stop there. It doesn't mean that Ukraine will accept that. Uh, Ukraine will not accept um, partial victory from Russia. U Ukraine will keep going for as long as Zelensky is in power, and I think even beyond that. But it will require Western support. But I think we would be um, the, the momentum right now is is remarkable, um, and, and I think we would be um, remiss if we didn't capitalize it, capitalize on it. Um, Negotiated settlement to pre-February 24th uh, status quo. The reason, and this is what well, it was discussed in the beginning of the war when the large offensive started, that perhaps letting Russia control uh, those self-proclaimed republics um, that were occupied since 2014 might be a, um, um, a tolerable trade-off for the in, in the foreseeable future. But the reason Ukraine would not agree to even that is because of all the war crimes, massive war crimes that had been uncovered uh, in areas of Russia, under Russia's occupation. So um, no government will, um, you know, will concede those territories knowing now and having evidence that um, conditions in those occupied, uh, you know, there's nothing short of genocide and ethnic cleansing. Uh, so it would be, um, it's, those are unacceptable terms. Um, there, of course, could be a decisive military victory by either side. Um, a decisive military defeat of either Ukraine's or Russia's armed forces is a low probability event um, because a total defeat of Russia's forces and their complete withdrawal from Ukraine will be extremely difficult for Ukraine right now as Russia has dug in very deep over the past eight years. It has been digging in um, you know, World War I style in, in the Donbass. Um, so it has, it also has the backing of Belarus. You know, I have some of my families actually in the Kiev area in northern Ukraine where their, um, you know, daily concern really is potential attack, uh, reinforcement coming from Belarus because they had already caught some Belarusian soldiers in the woods of, of Kiev out there. So they're always expecting some sort of an, um, uh, an operation, a special operation or uh, potentially, you know, reinforcements coming from Belarus, Russian or Belarusian. Belarus currently acts as, as a force multiplier for Russia. It, it has, uh, from, you know, shared sovereignty with Russia at best. If, you know, it'd probably be realistic to say that you, Belarus has no sovereignty. It is entirely a proxy of Russia's. And it shares a long border with Ukraine. So even if uh, Ukraine successfully repelled Russian attacks in the east and south, there's always a possibility of Belarus up north uh, being used as a launching pad. Um, of course, what's of, most cons of, of the greatest concern to all of us here is how this could spill over to a war with NATO. Um, 
So nuclear weapons, of course, remain uh, an important deterrence tool for Russia. Um, that in the Russian military doctrine, the use of tactical nuclear wep weapons in the battlefield um, presuppose a situation where Russia doesn't have advantage in conventional power, and we are in that moment right now. So um, when the, uh, the deficiencies in air power and uh, precision-guided, long-range precision-guided capabilities um, are decisive and not in Russia's favor, Russia might resort to a use of a tactical nuclear weapon. I think that's a, the uh, most experts estimate that the risk of a nuclear exchange now is greater than it was during the mis uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And that tells you something. Because we are in that predicament right now where Russia's conventional military um, is at a disadvantage and it cannot achieve the objectives set out by its political leadership. Therefore, um, you know, a, the use of tactical nuclear weapons is very likely, again, according to Russia's military doctrine. Now, um, the reason that the risk is high now, too, is because there are ongoing conversations right now about Ukraine has been asking the West for these uh, longer-range precision-guided missiles, ATACMS, that can strike deeper into, behind enemy lines and actually take out Russian ammo depots and logistical hubs, uh, command and control centers and whatnot. Um, so Ukraine has been asking, this conversation is ongoing, and some leadership in the U.S. are favorable to that. For Russia, um, providing Ukraine with, if the West provides Ukraine with these long-range capabilities, it's not a tactical advantage. Russia perceives these long-range uh, missiles as a strategic advantage for Ukraine that will potentially undermine Ukraine's econom uh, Russia's economic, political, and military power to the extent that it creates an existential threat. Again, prompting a potential use of tactical nuclear weapons. Um, so again, that's what the Russian military doctrine says about what it perceives as an existential threat to its national security, and these types of capabilities, long-range capabilities, are specifically um, described as being that red line. Now, Russia has shifted its red lines many times. It doesn't mean that they will necessarily act on this red line, but we don't know. And that's why I think the West is now in, is in a precarious situation where they're trying to avoid maxim, the binary choices, completely abandon Ukraine, uh, on the one hand, or extend their nuclear deterrence umbrella to Ukraine and actually retaliate on Ukraine's behalf if Russia were to deploy a nuclear weapon. So we're somewhere in between. Um, what the Biden administration has been practicing lately is the so-called strategic ambiguity, where we have not explicitly communicated our response were Russia to uh, deploy a tactical nuclear weapon. And I think that's probably the smartest way to approach the situation right now is to maintain that ambiguity, um, but we should be prepared to act decisively um, if, um, if Russia were to actually go that route. I don't know if they, if they would gain anything from deploying a tactical nuclear weapon, but uh, what I think will happen is that Russia will uh, potentially deploy a, um, a, a, a tactical nuclear missile somewhere over the Black Sea for demonstration purposes, just, just to show resolve. Uh, without casualties, without necessarily you know, uh, striking in any, any infrastructure, um, but just to show resolve uh, and intimidate and, and uh, paralyze the opponent. I, I can foresee that as a potential on the escalation ladder, um, but the U.S. should be prepared to, to act decisively. But we will never, I think what's likely to happen, in my opinion, is that the same thing that happened during the Cold War is there will be some back-channel diplomacy that um, will remain uh, classified. And most likely that these back-channel diplomacy efforts may already be ongoing right now. Uh, but strategic ambiguity is probably what we, the public, are stuck with uh, for the foreseeable future. And I, and I couldn't... Um, um, I was reading this um, a little um, leaflet here by a letter by Reverend uh, Rowe, and I thought in what he said here really encapsulates uh, the bottom line as, as far as um, you know how our involvement, how we uh, calibrate our own involvement here. Um, and I, I couldn't have said it better myself when he, where he said, 
We want to do everything possible to save Ukraine, but not do anything that might draw us in deeper. These are the paradoxes of our times and our faith. You know, we want Ukraine to win, but we don't want it to win too quickly and too decisively as to not to upset Russia and uh, lead to escalation. That is the paradox um, that we find ourselves uh, as Americans. Um, but I think we should still remind ourselves that Ukraine is, the reason Russia reinvaded Ukraine was not necessarily because it considers Ukraine's historical territory, but also because Ukraine has embraced Western values and Western institutions that we represent and that we promote and that we uh, celebrate. So in, in more than one way, the war against Ukraine is a war against Western civilization, Western values, Western institutions that Ukraine has dared to embrace. Uh, now, this is a, a, a fundamental, fundamentally a war for human rights. And I think all of us, and I don't speak as a Ukrainian, I'm a naturalized uh, American citizen. Um, of course, I care about the people of Ukraine and I care about this war. Um, but I also know, since I, I've been following it for eight years at least, um, and I witnessed, you know, I, I lived in the Soviet Union and I witnessed all these um, uh, transitions that, painful transitions that Ukraine has experienced on its journey to independence. And I know that what's happening now is different from anything that we have seen. This is not Russia versus uh, Ukraine. This is Russia versus Western civilization. Um, and I say it as a political scientist, you know, taking full responsibility <laughs> how, I, um, how I use my terms. Um, so with that, I, I would just quote in closing, as, as I invite your questions and comments, um, I wanted to quote a, um, uh, well, two people. One is a friend of mine in Western Ukraine. And when I asked, his, she said that her husband was looking for ways to receive combat deployment to the East. He wants to uh, join the fight in the front lines. And um, they, at the time, the, in, in June, they were not struggling for reinforcements, uh, so he was you know, denied um, entry. And I said, and one of her friends was killed in the front lines, and I said, so why do, you know, Western and Eastern Ukraine are so different culturally, linguistically, historically, and there's always been a little bit of a disconnect, and myself coming from Eastern Ukraine, I have to say that I came to America before I came to Western Ukraine. And that tells you a lot about how a lot of that um, kind of separation was manufactured politically, um, not sort of discouraging people. It's, it's different now, but that's history. And she said, um, I said, tell me about the young people in Western Ukraine, you know, why are they willing to, are they willing to fight and die uh, to liberate you know, these areas in Donbass? And she said, um, she said, we're not fighting for Donbass, we're fighting for our fellow Ukrainians to have a right to live in their homes because they would have done the same for us. She says, it's a, it, we're fighting for a right for every individual anywhere in Ukraine to not be expelled from their homes and to live in their homes. Um, and, and that's what we're fighting for. It's not about Eastern or Western Ukraine. And another, um, and that resonated with a, um, an elderly woman that I, I saw interviewed on, on TV yesterday from a liberated Kharkiv area when she said, when the Russians occupied Kharkiv and they came to her house and they said, why are you still here? You know, there's a war. You know, people should have got, you know, if you wanted to survive, it's basically your fault that you stayed. If you wanted to survive, you should have left because otherwise, you know, you basically invited it up on yourself. And she said, I know why I'm here, because I've been here my whole life. This is my home. Why are you here? And there was no answer. And that will tell you why Ukrainians feel strongly that they will win this war, because the Russian soldiers don't know. They don't know why they're there. And you can't win something that you can't identify. Um, so with that, um, I hope that you, I, I can congratulate you for staying informed and um, thank you for your attention and I very much appreciate your comments and questions. Thank you. Dr. Lennon, that was terrific. And
I have chills from that comment about fighting to stay in your home. And you will fight for the people in the other part of Ukraine so they can stay in their home. That's unbelievable. Anyways, Mike has a, uh, a, a microphone. I have one, so let's start the questions because I know there are a few. First of all, I'd like to thank you for a wonderful survey and making clear many things that I think we're all thinking about, wondering about. The question I have goes back to the paradox that you mentioned. I'm, I'm hearing in recent days that the counteroffensive has been maybe so successful that we're already starting to see signs of the West loosening up on its commitments to do next steps. And I just wondered if you had any perception there of what might be going on. I'm thinking particularly of uh, German tanks that haven't been delivered, uh, much less, you know, air superiority kinds of things. But could you comment on, on that if it's a real thing? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that is a great question. Um, I personally have actually witnessed somewhat opposite effect that um, because of how successful Ukraine's counteroffensive has been, that the West is more motivated to capitalize on that and to actually build on that momentum and give Ukraine what it needs in its next effort, in its next um, offensive or uh, you know, defensive maneuver, exactly because Ukraine has done so well. I, I think the West is more likely to, um, to react to battlefield successes, and we have, and that's why the U.S. started providing HIMARS and these long-range capabilities, exactly because the Ukrainians demonstrated uh, their ability to use these capabilities effectively um, and without, and, and in accordance with the guidelines provided to them, as in not leading, not striking into the Russian territory, other than obviously Crimea is Ukraine, we don't count that as Russian territory, um, and Ukraine has complied with all of those restrictions and has been very effective. So I think that story of success is more of a, um, um, it is a, dry, is a force to provide more, not less, is the way I have read it um, in the conversation that I have seen. Uh, you know, the German tanks, you know, those reservations are entirely political in nature. Of course, there's a narrative of escalation that they're, they're, the Europeans are afraid that providing um, Ukraine with you know these, these battle tanks and, and uh, fighter jets and, and offensive long range capabilities might lead to escalation, but that that is just a narrative. If you think about it, you know what what more escalation? What what else needs to happen? Right? More war crimes, more strikes on civilian um, infrastructure or residential areas. We have seen all of that. Short of a you know, nuclear exchange, I think we have seen just about you know, the most uh, extreme level of escalation that Russia has, has brought. Um, so European politics, again, a lot of it has uh, connections to energy politics because Europeans are facing a really cold winter um, and they're trying to leverage, they're trying to balance um, their uh, foreign policy in such a way as to preserve um, Russian gas imports. Um, and of course, Russia is now leveraging that and at the same time, um, be uh, um, you know unified in their response with the rest of the European Union. So I think that cohesion within the European Union is is also uh, currency because one of Russia's goals is to fracture the European Union, and that's why it plays energy politics and this escalation rhetoric so well is to is to fracture the European Union so that you know Germany um, versus um, you know, Poland versus the Baltic countries have different ways in which they want to, uh, to, to approach this, um, this help. Um, again, I don't see the, the German tanks um, reservations as um, um, motivated by uh, military calculations so much as political. So it's, it, it will not depend on how well Ukraine does on the battlefield. It will continue to depend on how Germany wants to play energy politics with Russia. And on that note, a little anecdote uh, that you might have heard that, the, you know who the country that has been 
the largest supply of tanks to Ukraine? The country that has supplied Ukraine with the greatest number of tanks? Russia. Um, Ukraine. <laughs> Ukraine has actually recaptured, um, as Russians were retreated from Kiev and from Kharkiv, they were leaving everything behind. Uh, I mean, these are Soviet tanks that Ukraine knows how to operate and maintain. So uh, they have, <laughs> but Ukraine is more obviously and better. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I, my understanding is that uh, the use of mercenaries is quite active in the Russian troops and that Putin does not want to reenact a draft in Russia for perhaps obvious reasons it would impact the people in a way they didn't like. Is that something that's a significant consideration? It is and um, you know Wagner, one of the uh, more prolific, uh, more notorious um, mercenaries uh, Military, uh, uh, private military contractors in, in, in Russia. You know, they're only private in name. These are, you know, all these paramilitary organizations and private military contractors are a tool of, the Krem of Kremlin's foreign policy. They are, um, you know, they take the orders from the Kremlin, even though they're private in name. Um, you know, they're more, you know, you know, Chechen mercenaries are known for their brutality. Um, that, that is obviously a concern, but I think what we shouldn't be misled by is that these are private contractors. So these are, you know, this is sort of a shadow mobilization, as some people call it, is that Putin trying to avoid the political backlash from announcing general mobilization, knowing that how unpopular it's going to be. Uh, but at this point, I don't think it will help Russia, even if they were able to mobilize um, private military contractors or even if they went the general mobilization route, um, it would just not be decisive at this point as it's too late. They would not be able to, to turn the tide. Um, but what's concerning uh, regarding that is that, um, you know, private military contractors are, especially in some Chechen fighters, unknown for their brutality and a lot of war crimes around Kiev were specifically linked to the Wagner group. Their recruitment tactics are brutal. You might have seen some of the more recent reports um, that just recently came out of um, these uh, recruitment speeches that were given in prisons, Russian prisons, promising um, inmates uh, amnesty, basically, for, uh, for joining, uh, enlisting in, in the Russian in the regular army or in, in, in PMC, uh, PMC groups, um, and basically incentivizing war crimes. In, in plain language uh, for amnesty. So I think that there is absolutely no, um, it's, it's, it's the, the world's worst kept secret as to how private Russian mercenaries are and, and, and whether they're actually detached from the Kremlin. And these are ultimately the, the instruments of Russian military power. Um, what do you think would, uh, would if, there were, if the Putin regime were not able to survive this, what do you think the risk of something worse coming from within Russia? Um, Somebody worse than Putin, yeah. Um, well, it's I mean, a possibility. There's a, lot of, there, he, there's a lot of people behind him that aren't pleased with uh, him taking not taking as hard a line as they are. Right, um, there's, that sentiment is beginning to percolate, but again, we don't know if it's going to be, if the critical mass is going to be uh, sufficient in numbers to actually overthrow Putin's regime. Um, so what we haven't really seen uh, much um, uh, diversion of Russian political elites from you know, Putin's foreign policy. I mean, there's, there's some uh, you know, opposition voices on TV that are, again, beginning to appear, um, but not enough to where there would be an, a detectable opposition leader that we could say, you know, this person could have. Navalny is uh, in jail. I think he has been looked at as a potential um, contestant to, to Putin's power, but you know, everybody who had any potential had been jailed. Um, and for somebody to, Putin's successor is probably being groomed right now. Um, you know, Russia is not, uh, I mean, it's only democracy in name, 
but the succession of power is, is unlikely to come as a result of an open election. Um, so most likely, whoever succeeds Putin will be somebody from his circles, um, probably from the security apparatus. Um, now, it, it's not a given, though, that they will change Russia's foreign policy uh, under the pressure of sanctions or uh, you know, popular discontent. Um, I think that anti-Western sentiment is still very strong, even among average Russians. And I have some family in Russia. I can also um, uh, you know, verify that just from my personal sort of accounts, was, uh, conversations with people, how much everything that all Russia's problems are blamed on the West. That is a prevailing narrative. Um, and I think the next um, successor will still capitalize on that anti-Western sentiment because that is what resonates in Russia <laughs> domestically. Uh, but they might be more friendly in terms of um, negotiating on arms control or you know, um, a new Euro Euro European security architecture. Um, but I don't, I don't foresee Russia to rewiring itself um, the Russian society, the Russian political elites. Um, Putin was, has been cultivated um, in, in this environment that doesn't see the West as, doesn't see Ukraine as, as its own state, nor does it see the West as trustworthy. They there's a lack of trust. There's a fundamental mistrust that everything that the West does is to get closer, is to get back at Russia. So I think that um, mistrust, however this ends, um, the Russian society will not just rewire itself. You know, I, I think nothing short of a Marshall Plan eventually is going to be required for the West. If they wanted to bring democratic reforms to Russia, then it would require a significant amount of effort and investment um, to bring democratic institutions, free press, um, education, and, and all those things. Um, but currently, the Russian domestic environment is such that political elites are supportive of Putin's foreign policy, and we shouldn't be too optimistic that with Putin's departure, however it happens, something better will, will come in his place, because that's just not the political environment in Russia that cultivates uh, those leaders. And then there's also, there has always been the deep-seated fear among uh, American political elites, uh, some of them, that a fractured Russia is much worse than a, um, an authoritarian Russia that's under central control. At least now we know who is in charge of nuclear weapons. Um, if Russia were to fracture and there was a civil war and you know, various, Russia is a federation. You know, we keep forgetting that you know, Russia has, is a very diverse uh, federation. So if, if these uh, ethnic republics were to break away, then the level of instability and violence that that would unleash on the region is beyond anybody's imagination. So, and I think that has always been, has been a deterrent in and of itself in kind of preserving this sort of central government in Russia as something that we can identify as a threat, but at least know that it's centralized. Um, there is, a, in, in the foreign policy um, groups, there is a sizable contingent of experts who believe that, um, you know, keeping power, keeping this sort of centralized power in Russia is the best case scenario for the West. Um, because otherwise, we're just not prepared to deal with that instability. All right, Alice. Hi, thank you again for coming. This has been really informative. I wanted to ask about China and if you could comment on the relations between China and Russia. And we've been hearing a lot about how China views Taiwan in, a, in ways that seem similar to the way uh, Russia views uh, Ukraine, and, and how th those relationships between the two nations of China and Russia might change the picture for Putin in terms of its uh, military power. All right, it's a great question. Um, you know, they just had a meeting the other day. Uh, it was a meeting in Uzbekistan of regional powers where Putin had talked to Xi Jinping. And it was the first time ever that uh, Putin had referenced in his speech. He said, I understand that China has concerns about uh, the Ukraine crisis, as he called it, some problems in Ukraine. Um, but, you know, hopefully they will recognize the threat that Western, the West poses to China and Russia. So we're definitely seeing this attempt to, uh, this alignment of democracies versus autocracies. 
where China and Russia are actually, and India um, are also, you know, kind of uh, getting closer, but they're pragmatic partners. They're not ideological partners. They're pragmatic uh, partners. So the way I see it, I don't necessarily, um, honestly, I don't uh, see a lot of um, potential there for real cooperation or alliance between Russia and China. Russia and China will never become a formal alliance. I don't think that that's in the cards. They will be trading partners, but not an alliance to where they will extend their uh, you know, defense and deterrence to each other. Um, I, I don't see that happening because it, that's just not in China's uh, in China's interest. Um, China has been neutral, has abstained from commenting on Ukraine. So it's not actively supportive. It's not, um, and I think that should be concerning to, uh, to Russia as China continues to support Russia economically. It, it continues to trade with Russia. It provides Russia with uh, the parts that it can get from the West. But um, it's, it has increasingly been an unequal partnership to where Russia needs China more than China needs Russia. And the, the West has been uh, practicing what, what we call in political science in a, a driving a wedge uh, strategy where the West is now trying to do everything to, um, to pull China away from Russia offering, and India, offering incentives and, and um, um, other um, tactics uh, to prevent Russia and China from uh, from getting closer with Taiwan. I honestly think it's a it's somewhat um, it's it's a common analogy. I, I think that China Taiwan policy is completely independent from what happens between. That's what China considers its sphere of influence, and it's going to handle it however it wants to handle it. Um, I don't think that there is a lot of talk about how what Russia is doing in Ukraine is going to encourage China to invade Taiwan. I don't really think that China pays calibrates its foreign policy toward Taiwan around what happens in Ukraine. I, I, I don't see that analogy to, to be um, plausible in, in my opinion. But you know, we make analogies because that's kind of how, how it's easy to understand the world that way. Um, so I, I think the bottom line is that um, even though China is currently um, helping Russia stay afloat, but it won't be for much longer. Uh, long term, Russia's economy is going to tank. Um, and I don't know what, what that will mean for all of us. All right, Annie, you've got the last word. Um, I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you about India and its involvement um, as one of the four states supporting uh, Russia. Could you talk to us a little bit about how India is involved has anything changed since 2014 with them compared to now? Um, India is trying to balance um, to where they can maintain their relationships with the West and also trade with Russia. Um, so they're, tr they're trying to uh, play that balancing act. But what they're mostly interested in is cheap energy because Russia offered an incredible discount to India as a way to export its energy uh, you know, due to the sanctions. And India has not been in a position to say no. They've, it's been um, you know, economic, pragmatically, it has been a really good deal for India that it, it has accepted. So um, again, the West now is trying to play this, this strategy of where we can offer better incentives or better um, propositions to disincentivize India. So I think India is on the fence. I think in, they don't have any uh, you know, ideological loyalties or commitments um, to Russia and, and could, easily, um, could easily be swayed away from um, you know, enabling Russia's economy further. Um, but the, I think the West has to be a little bit more proactive in engaging India uh, and recognizing that uh, as a strategic choice as opposed to just kind of, you know, letting it, turning a blind eye to it. Um, but I don't see a lot of potential there in the India-Russia cooperation because currently it's, it's, it's just mostly pragmatic um, and energy driven. But India has also, uh, also relies on Russia for weapon exports. You know, part of it comes from the Soviet Union legacy. India used to buy a lot of Soviet equipment and that, that relationship has maintained uh, with you know the independent Russia, um, that is also a a, um, a market um, that or a, a dynamic that 
is of strategic importance to India. So given the, and it's much cheaper. So I think given, um, if, if India is presented with better options, and if we can be more intentional about it, I, I think we could um, realistically sway India away from Russia. All right, uh, we've uh, gone much longer than I thought we would. And we thank you, that was a great tour de force. Uh, a round of applause for Dr. Lennon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I, India ended up being the, the, the punchline, but I, again, I want, you, I, I want to thank you for paying attention, for staying inform, informed. I know your church alone has done a lot of fundraising and vigils and various other engagements and events and, and keeping attention on Ukraine. Um, and I want to thank you and also encourage you to, you know, uh, spread the word and, and continue keeping Ukraine in your prayers as um, unfortunately, this will go on for longer than we want it to. Um, but everybody's effort is, and when I go to Ukraine and you know, uh, time and again, we hear of how much people know and feel the support coming from overseas and it's just so uplifting, just even knowing that, that people care. Uh, so thank you again. Um, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of this wonderful afternoon um, and um, have some good lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.